we rejoice in the fact that one day we will be reunited again in heaven. Prayerfully, Reverend Elder Rochelle Brown. We're here because we love him, because his life touched our life in one way or another. And this we know for sure, that Reverend Houston touched more lives than we will ever know. And I'm so grateful for all of the different stories and the way that he has touched so many lives that bring us here. He's sorely missed so much every day. Would you join me in prayer, please? Almighty and everlasting God, you are very near us in times of trouble. When our hearts are overwhelmed, our refuge is in you. You are our Savior the same yesterday, today, and forever. And of your love there is no end. Thank you for the life of our beloved Reverend Houston. Thank you for his love and leadership and strength and all that he is that brings us together this day to celebrate his life. God, we miss him. And we pray that you would make your presence more real to us than our sorrow and grant us such strong faith in you as shall bring us to light and peace, that peace that passes all understanding, and that it would guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. 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 I invite you now to rise as you're able as we sing a song that Reverend Houston liked, the one that is good for us even right now, leading on the everlasting earth. God be with you. And also with you. I am the resurrection and the life, saith our God. All that believeth in me, though they were dead, yet shall they live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though this body be destroyed, yet shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold, and not as a stranger. For none of us liveth to themselves, and no one dieth to themselves. For if we live, 
We live unto God, and if we die, we die unto God. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are God's. Blessed are the dead who die in our Redeemer. Even so saith the Spirit, for they shall rest from their labors. You may be seated. Good afternoon. <laughs> my name is Steve Burnside, and uh, Houston was my uncle. And uh, you, about a month ago, Pastor Dan called me and asked me if I would do the eulogy. So I did what any good millennial would do. I went to Google and Googled eulogy. <laughs> now, to be fair, I'm not a millennial. My sister is, so I just figured I'd lean on that. <laughs> so after I got off with him, you know, Pastor Dan and really looked up eulogy, I found it interesting because when I see somebody give me a eulogy or see a eulogy written, normally it's just a list of dates and times and accomplishments that that person has done in their life. Yet the word eulogy actually is defined as a piece of writing that praises someone highly, typically for somebody who's just passed. And I started thinking about the things that I could say up here that could really honor the man that my uncle Houston was. All of us in this current world can go look at dates and times and accomplishments, and we can go look at when he got his degree from San Diego State and when he got out of the military, but I wanted to give you a perspective of who Houston was as an uncle and as a man of family. And I wanted to bring you a perspective that you couldn't find by just Googling a name. And so first and foremost, as many of you know, Uncle Houston loved to have a good time. He actually, my brother, sister, and myself, our first trip to Disneyland was with Uncle Houston and with Bruno. I literally remember the real Disneyland before that parking structure. <laughs> Pulling up when you could get right into the front doors. And I remember walking in with them. And one of the most amazing things is I, I, I mean, my sister was probably five, you know, five, seven, and nine were probably the ages of us. And they let us go have a good time. And I remember him telling us, just be back here in 20 minutes. And I thought, I'm glad Mom isn't here. <laughs> in addition to loving having a good time, Uncle Houston loved music. He loved all kinds of music, from country to rock, musicals and jazz. He loved a cappella and choral and old-time church hymns. Uh, he got that from his dad, who loved music also, and that was passed on to my dad and uh, my aunt and everybody else in the Burnside family, pretty much. Um, everything from elementary school, when he sang the choir uh, there. And I, I did, talking with my aunt, I heard a story that I believe happened here that he, I, now I have not seen this, but something about Beth Miller, a mermaid costume, and this stage. Uh, and he was just having a great time singing songs up here in the vein of that Midler. So Uncle Houston truly did love music. Uncle Houston also did not let his disability stop him. As a, as a kid living at 7854 Blue Lake Drive, San Diego, California, 92109. <laughs> if anybody has that possible for sale, we'd like to buy it. Anyway, um, I remember being probably about eight years old, and we had a ping pong table there. Now, at eight, you're not really thinking through what you're asking people, you're just asking people. And it was one of the first times where I watched somebody that obviously should have told me, no, I, ping pong probably isn't my thing. Instead, he said, I said, Uncle Houston, can we play some ping pong? And he, had, he immediately said, yes, let's play some ping pong. Now, that was amazing to me, and more amazing now that I think back on that, of how many times I say no to things in a full, able body. And I'm inspired by those moments in my life where Uncle Houston didn't look at himself as somebody in a wheelchair or somebody that had disabilities. He looked at himself as a fully able, fully competent person that can do whatever he wanted. He stood in the presence of politicians, and he stood in the presence of the poor and hungry all at the same time without any, letting any of his disabilities stop him. Another thing about Uncle Houston that 
as a nephew, you would know is he loved technology as long as it had an apple on it. <laughs> My first computer was an Apple IIe that he generously donated after he had upgraded to the latest and greatest Macintosh. And uh, it was always a point of conversation. Now, you might be out there thinking, why are we talking about Apple products? It's because there becomes a time in your life as a, a preteen and a teenager where we were living in San Luis Obispo and Uncle Houston was down in San Diego. And I didn't have a car and my mom didn't want to drive seven hours all the time. And, and sometimes you can start disconnecting. But I remember vividly coming down to San Diego, getting in the van, and going to the Apple store as we, as we were able to look at the new Macintosh computers that were out there. And it became a, honestly, a, almost like a, a glue that held the relationship together long enough for me to be able to travel my, on my own and have my own car and come down and talk and, and those sorts of things. And as you know here, he was always looking at technology, loved working on the computer, loved having his cell phone, loved everything that technology could do. Uncle Houston loved good food. Can I get an amen? Yeah. <laughs> and as, as a, a teen, freaking even a 20-year-old growing up without a huge bank account, you appreciated that Uncle Houston loved good food. And I remember him telling me once, you know, you probably won't get a Christmas gift from us UPS to your house, but every time you see Bruno and I, we will make sure to take care of your food. And I'm telling you, I think that food was uh, more detrimental to their checking account than any Christmas presents that they could have ever given us. And I had some of the food experiences that I don't think I would have ever had without him. And an appreciation for what food and family really means coming together and looking back at those meals. A, a, a fun anecdote is they were actually, uh, Houston and Bruno were up in my neck of the woods, Paso Robles, California. This was probably two years ago now, three years ago now. And one of my sons was sick, and they had invited us to go out to a dinner. And they said, well, don't worry, we'll actually just drop food off at your house. It'll be fine. Now, we're used to, we'll drop food off at your house. Here's a Costco lasagna and a bag of chips. Hope you have a good time. There was enough lobster tail in that box to probably feed a small army. And my wife and I were talking about this just the other day, about how amazing it was that he always made sure we were taken care of, ate well, and had community around the dinner table. But most of all, of, of all of those things, Uncle Houston was always there. He was always there to listen. And when my dad unexpectedly passed away, he was there to step in as a father role. About a year after my dad passed away, I remember I was in, encountering something in life that, like we all do, work stuff, family stuff. And I was, I was sitting in the living room thinking, I, I don't have anybody to call. My dad's not here. You know, I don't know what to do here. And I remember calling Uncle Houston, and without skipping a beat, he just filled that role with my dad. And he took that role till the day he passed away. I was able to talk to him, he was a mentor, he was literally another dad in my life. For many of us in this room, my Uncle Houston would be defined as a friend, a mentor, a pastor, a reverend, a confidant. For just a, a second, if you feel like you could classify Houston, Uncle Houston, Pastor Houston, Reverend Houston, as somebody that has had a, an impact on your life that you will always remember, can you just raise your hand for a moment? And as we talked about earlier, if you just keep, keep lifted for one second, you can stretch it out a little bit. A eulogy is a speech that praises someone. But beyond words, the impact that Houston had if you just look around on the people in this room, is beyond any words that a eulogy could speak. I would encourage you, to, as you think about Houston today and ongoing, think about how he impacted your life and how we can impact people for the kingdom of God. Thank you.
afternoon, everybody. My name is Chris Ward, and I'm a council member from the city of San Diego, representing the third council district, many of the uh, historically uh, LGBTQ communities, the heart of uh, San Diego community. And it is my pleasure, on behalf of my colleagues, uh, to be here with a memoriam for the family and for the entire church as we adjourn uh, the meeting of the city council on December 4th in the memory of Reverend Burnside. Uh, Stephen, thank you so much for that eulogy, for those personal stories, for those touches. They certainly are uh, ones that we felt so deeply here in the San Diego community. And I know Houston was somebody uh, that's been a constant presence for many of us here, and particularly from times before um, what we are experiencing today, from times of transition. He was a pioneer. He was a pioneer for this church. He was a pioneer for San Diego Pride. Uh, he was definitely somebody that we could look up to uh, as somebody that was a sense of security for those that were struggling with their own faith, uh, people that were fearing coming out. Uh, he was there for us in the 1980s and the 1990s and really saw, uh, helped lay the groundwork uh, for much that we were able to enjoy here today. He embodied life. Um, he embodied ability, and we heard about that and remember that, that even though he had some physical challenges, you never really ever saw that when you had the opportunity to engage with Houston. Uh, he was somebody that I think gave that hope and that inspiration in a wide, wide range of ways, um, whether they were through someone's daily activities or whether they were uh, in how we think about the thought or how we think about faith. Houston was somebody that we could confide in, that we could talk to, um, who we all felt deeply understood us, whether you're a family uh, or a stranger or a member of this congregation. He was so approachable and loving, and uh, as we heard before, he was always there. Um, so with that, it certainly is a deep uh, condolences to Bruno and Connie and Sue and the entire Burnside family and to the church here, Reverend Caven, Reverend Van, um, and all those that he had the chance to interact with. Uh, I know that his service was long and was deep here, and uh, you're right, it wasn't just 25 years. He was always looking for those opportunities to continue to give back, both here in the church, uh, to others, and to the broader community. So it's my pleasure and deep honor to be here with you briefly uh, this afternoon as we celebrate his life. And I want to thank you so much, um, Houston, for all that you gave to San Diego. We are deeply grateful uh, and will be in your debt. Thank you. Good afternoon. I am uh, Senate President Pro Tem Senator Tony Atkins, and I, I'm just honored and I appreciate so much being able to be here today with all of you. Uh, it seems like we were just here not that long ago. Um, Stephen, I want to say thank you because the best part of celebrations of life in my mind is hearing from friends and family and learning things and getting to hear uh, real stories about real lives of people, uh, and particularly one that I have admired for actually about three decades now. Um, gosh, I don't know why. I'm, you know, it's just this community is so wonderful. This church is so embracing and so filled with love. And every opportunity I get to be here, I feel it. Um, Stephen, when you asked us to raise our hands about uh, Houston and if he had touched our lives, well, Houston touched my life in ways that are just incredible, and yet we never talked. We would see each other in passing, uh, and he would always smile and wave and ask how I was, and I would wave at him. You know, it's one of those things where, you, you know, you must have thought someone would always be around, right? And you would have that opportunity. So, Reverend Dan, it is true. We should say how much we love everybody that's in our lives and you know, what they mean to us every single day. No, I really believe it when I say I would not be here were it not for Houston as one person, but a number. You know, um, a number of years ago uh, when Chris Kehoe, and she's so sorry she couldn't be here today, she was traveling most of the week, but I told her I would be here and I would give you her kind regards uh, to the family in particular. Um, you know, a bunch of years ago, Chris Kehoe ran for city council. And uh, there were a number of people, and a couple of them are here in this room. I see George, I know Al's here. Let's see, I'm gonna get in trouble if I start naming names. <laughs> uh, but Houston was one of those people, because in the beginning, um, we had to get people to believe in Chris, and to believe that a member of the LGBT community could actually run for office and win. 
And we didn't have those successes then. We didn't have those victories. And in order to do that, we had to determine if she could. And there were a very small group of people, and those of you uh, that I, I you know, who put forward money to see if Chris would be viable. It was, in those, in those days, it was a lot of money. It's still a lot of money to some of us. It was about $500. And Houston was one of those people who stepped forward along with George and Ben Dillingham and a number of people uh, that are members of this congregation or have been, uh, some who are no longer with us. And they made that commitment. And you know, they did it because they knew, uh, as this church knows, as we talked about a, a month or so ago when we were here at the last celebration of life, um, what it meant for this community to be accepted in society. And Houston understood, along with a number of people, what that meant. And that it would mean that we would have a real place in society, and that there would be equality, and that we would have every opportunity as a marginalized community to contribute to our community. He was a service member, a veteran. So many of us are. Uh, we want to contribute to our communities. He's a man of faith. And I love that he loved music. You know, the song on the back by um, Andre Crouch, one of my favorites. Uh, we played Andre Crouch when I got sworn in as speaker of the assembly. And I wanted this one, but the person singing couldn't actually do it. <laughs> so they played another Andre song. So, you know, it's all about the small connections in life. And so I'm so glad uh, to hear how much he loved music. And I will say this, after Houston was part of that, and, you know, I wouldn't be here as the leader of the Senate of the state of California, the fifth largest economy in the world, without people like Reverend Houston Burnside. It is true, I know it, I know that City Council Member Ward agrees with me, Todd Gloria agrees with me, Kevin Pfizer, on and on and on. And he made that happen because he helped put the seed forward. And forever, we are changing the world. And so when we talk about the work that we can do and how we can touch other lives, here is a man who never once called me to ask for anything. Not once. Not once. Now, there were many people who did, and they swore they were the top volunteer on my campaign. <laughs> <laughs> so he is an example of love, of compassion, of dedication to community, of equality, and I am just honored I got to meet him and to know him. So Bruno, to you, to Connie, to Sue, to Stephen, to Lisa, I want to say how sorry I am for your loss. It is profound, but it is our loss too. And to Reverend Dan, who I know had a special relationship, as did many, I am so sorry for your loss. I'm honored to be here, and we have been out of session at the state, we just went back on January 7th. I will be sure and read this on the record on the floor of the California State Senate in honor of an incredible human being. And I will leave this with Stephen to say from the bottom of our hearts, we thank you for his role in the world and for your making it possible for him to be part of our lives. Mm -hmm.
God is with us. And I hold on to that, Emmanuel, even right now. So let these words of Scripture comfort you, and I say let's comfort one another. That hug, that smile, that squeeze of the hand that says so much without saying a single word. All of those things as we support each other and ourselves, as we remember and even celebrate. Someone that hadn't been here in a long time came to me at the beginning of this service and said, thank you for having a celebration for our friend Houston. And so, yeah, there is sadness and there is grief and there is also celebration because what a life, what an impact. And I just can't ever forget those little sparkly wheels as he was just going around. And sometimes faster than you, you better get out of the way if he's coming to your way and skipping out of the way because he'll go right over those toes. And I think about that. Somebody said, I can just see him right now in those sparkly wheels going up that ramp to heaven. And I said, no. He's running in front of that thing. And he is not in that wheelchair. God bless you. Reverend Tony Freeman, the senior pastor. Wow. You got some stories, I'm sure. Yeah, it's, uh, it's just hard to really to imagine MCC San Diego without you. No, know, I, I just can't, I just can't quite go there. It just seems surreal, doesn't it? I mean, he's always been, he's always been such an important part of this community of faith. And even today, as we've been sitting here, I keep waiting for him to come up in his chair and come, maybe, maybe running a few minutes late, <laughs> but on his way. And, and to get, as Dan said, one of those hugs, and it was a unique hug, you know, but he would lean into you with his head and squeeze your hand, and I just kept thinking how much I would love to have one more of those with Well, Dan told me I had five minutes. <laughs> a couple times. <laughs> and I, I want to ask you, Dan, if, uh, how well did that work when you told you spent five minutes? <laughs> uh, well, I would like to offer uh, my condolences on behalf of the Council of Elders um, to everyone gathered here all of Houston's many family and friends, and just know that we send our heartfelt uh, prayers and uh, condolences and our love to all of you. And um, one of the things that uh, Houston and I were sitting somewhere and there was a sermon and the title was something about being bitter or better. It's a good one, isn't it? Yeah. Pretty easy to remember. And as I was listening to that sermon, I was thinking about Houston. Yeah. Because, you know, we all have obstacles in our lives. We all have challenges. And we all have the opportunity to respond to them with either bitterness at our lot in life, or we can become better. And to me, Houston was the epitome of being better. He said no to those obstacles and those challenges. They're not going to get me down. And he rose up above them, not only to be a better person, but to help make me a better person and to make all of us a better community and a better world to live in. And so I am eternally grateful for the ways that he inspired me for the ways at times he challenged me. And you know what? As I was thinking about that Dan, you know, his, his Houston's moments of truth, you know, he'd say that's not how it goes. Um, 
And the reality is he did it with love. He did it with love. And in those times, even then, he was helping to make me a better person. So I am being eternally grateful for him. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that uh, you may not know, my, during my tenure term here as senior pastor, uh, Houston had more titles than anyone <laughs> had ever had. And, and, and it was like his title to shore, right? And, and as I was thinking about that too, it really reflected his versatility and his willingness to step in there and do what was ever was needed at the time. And what an incredible blessing it was, um, even though poor Lee trying to keep up with uh, getting the right title in the Metro Lake was a challenge. <laughs> Nonetheless, you know, what a blessing that was to me and to this community of faith. And, uh, I just want to close by saying that in this season of giving and receiving, my hope and prayer is that we will all reflect on the gift that Reverend Houston was to all of us and to this community and to our world. Now comes an opportunity for us to be able to share, and I'm going to ask that we try to limit it to one or two minutes, as uh, we don't want to be here till 5 p.m. And, uh, and I know that there are wonderful, wonderful stories to share. And uh, we have uh, interim pastors that. Uh, Reverend Houston made such an impact that they are here for this service. Uh, Reverend Dusty Pruitt and Reverend John Gill both served as interim pastors here. I'm going to ask them to come up right now and they'll begin this time to share and then we'll open it up to everybody else. It's it might seem strange to say that I knew Reverend Houston before I met him. Back in the old days of the fellowship, there were so many of us that we knew one another by name, but not in person. At the uh, Minneapolis St. Paul Conference, one morning at breakfast, up in the ballroom, that it turned into a favor. Houston was sitting by himself, and I thought, this is my opportunity. When over, we began to talk. We got so involved, I remember we didn't make the general council meeting that morning. <laughs> Okay. And when I had an opportunity to become the interim pastor here, I realized I'd have an opportunity to work with him, and it turned out to be in the area of worship. He crafted worship with a God-centered spirit that was incredible. I didn't always understand it, but he would just smile at me and explain the details to me. And I'm not sure this church ever fully appreciated the way they benefited in their worship experience through the work that he offered. But we also had fun with him. John, my spouse, and I would join with Houston and make the journey to a local casino from time to time. <laughs> we called it our ministry to the machines. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhere in Ireland is a tombstone, and etched on that tombstone are these words. Death brings us heartaches that no person can heal. But love brings us memories that no person can steal. We loved you, and we still do. So I'm Dusty Cruin, and I was the interim between uh, the long-term pastorate of um, Reverend David Farrell and uh, Reverend John Cruin. And uh, at the time, I had been unemployed, and I had gotten a job with United Airlines, and so I could not be here full time. And so, nevertheless, the board of directors took a chance on allowing me to be. 
interim pastor, and uh, they call me the interim pastor, and they call Reverend Houston the assistant pastor, but really we were co-pastors because he ran the church during the week, and I sort of was here over the weekend. And we were wonderful colleagues together, and I loved him very much, but I'd already known him before uh, because we were in the same district and we went to conferences together. And so I, at my church up in Long Beach, we bought this building that had a sanctuary on the second floor. And there was no way up but the stairs. And uh, so at one conference, I remember Reverend Houston came, and the ne next thing I see is four guys hauling him up to the second floor. <laughs> and I think I said something to the matter of an apology, and he sort of shot down and said, that's okay, they're really monkey. <laughs> but during that time, it wasn't, you know, I knew Houston, he knew us, he was a part of us, and, and very much a gentleman, and he really, that's okay, they're really lucky. But there were others who came to worship with us on crutches and a wheelchair, and they just had to turn around and go home. And it just broke my heart as a pastor. Broke my pastor's heart. And I remember sitting one time in a uh, conference and I, I had, was having breakfast with Houston and I was pouring out my pastor's broken heart to him about what was going on because we had tried to raise money for a chariot and after about a year we had come up with about $3,000 for a $40,000 chariot that I was just, uh, in the meantime people were coming in and having to leave. Houston had an idea. He said, I have an idea. Don't you have the ability to beam me up if I were to preach down on the bottom floor and you could beam me up to the sanctuary? I said, we do. So we set up all of these TV monitors. Houston came in, he sat in his wheelchair, and he preached to us over TV monitors and said, we need to be able to get people like you. All right. You know, those people over there, well, I said, in two months, we had to be able to generosity and love and openness, uh, he was able to, I think, do a great deal for um, the Metropolitan Community Church and our understanding of how to be accessible to people who are different from people. And so I appreciate him so much. And my condolences to everyone's loss, our loss as well. Uh, but we know he's in a better place. He's with the Lord. And I think it's a great place. Thank you. First of all, I want to say thank you to my friend here. He's been very strong for all of us through this. And God bless you, Dan. And thank you for being here for us. Give us strength so we can do this. A couple of memories I have of Houston involved the chair and making Houston up. We had a beach party one year. And Houston wanted to come out. He came to the beach park. Okay, how do we get Houston out? Come to the sand. Very simple. He goes, just take me up and carry me out there. Okay, he was about 600 pounds. <laughs> the entire time we round the people up, pick them up and take them out there, he had total faith in all of us. And he told us to pick them up. He goes, You guys can do this. I have faith in you. And this is going to be a great day. And we picked them up and took them out. We got them to the sand. And we had a wonderful time. Another time after he retired, we were over at the social hall. And we started talking. He goes, pull up a chair. Sit down. Let's have a conversation. Right in the middle of the social hall. With everybody had to go completely walk around us <laughs> to get to where they were going to go. And he was just fine with that. And I was just fine with that. And that was... Houston with me. So um, I thank God that he was in my life, and I thank God for this church and for the family. My condolences, and we're all uh, better off than he's part of our lives. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Houston was a very 
very special pastors. Spiritual guy occasionally after church. Uh, we would go to Munch. Um, some of you don't know the area, right across the highway is a Hilton Resort. And there's a lovely little upscale restaurant called Aqua. If you would like to attend, that was wheelchair accessible. And we would have good food. We ate oysters. We would then have fellowship. And that was something so precious to me to have after service. It's one thing to attend a service, but it's another to have quiet one on one time fellowship with a pastor and a spiritual guide. And in such a beautiful location on the bay there. And so for those two hours, it was like a vacation. I have fellowship with a pastor. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I've been a member here since I think 1984, and um, I was the one who turned Houston into the mermaid, didn't I? <laughs> it was a fundraiser called Activists and Drag. A bunch of us were crazy fools cool enough to say yes, we'll raise money. I think it was for the community, actually not the church. And uh, I said, Houston, have you ever done drag? And he said, no. I said, you know, Beth Midler's got a great song. It was something to do with a palm tree and a mermaid, so I made this mermaid thing and got him somehow into this mermaid outfit and the palm tree, and on 30th Street, you know, he'd come wheeling out. Here he comes wheeling out, the palm tree's just going, <laughs> and I did you not. Somehow he made his legs flip like a mermaid. And that is my special memory of his yeah. And he was better than Ben Midler could ever hope. <laughs> he sang that song he did with the beat. So, what a special man. We also did the greatest gift together on um, a Christmas production that we did at um, Spratless Theater. And Houston and I worked together on that. I have to say it was a challenge at times because we're both control freaks. Uh, <laughs> somehow God worked through us and we had a very successful show that we And we blessed this whole San Diego community. I think we had about 700 people attend. And it was a blessing. It was because Houston laid the groundwork for us to get that being presented. So he is definitely a blessing to all of us. <laughs> Spoiler alert, uh, there's going to be a video montage right after this, or a photo montage. Look for the picture of Reverend Easton <laughs> in the mermaid outfit. I love Mr. Long Time. At one point, I was a big At one point, I thought, I can do ministry, I can hold, I can act like me. And I was a Houston on a number of occasions when somebody said to me that I want to just serve the community. I recognize how it is. And he said, maybe you don't do that, but you can. So do it. And after I served the community, he said, now pray with me. I took a step back and I said, no, let's do not just don't pray. I pray. He said, then there's a whole congregation out there watching you. And then we'll be standing. <laughs> I, uh, I just want to testify to the Spreckles event that uh, David and Houston are definitely control freaks. <laughs> I was the um, state manager. So we had a lot of fun for each. It came off. It came off really good. But what I wanted to mention: when I came to MCC 20 years ago, I was in a real rough place, and it was the most welcoming congregation, welcoming place to go. And Houston was a big part of that. He found out that I worked as a conductor on Amtrak, and it wasn't good. We said, "You're going to put on a train together. We're going to go. Can we go to LA and have lunch together." And I go, okay. So not only did we take the train up to LA. We then went down and took the underground, the metro, over to Universal Studios. We went up and had lunch. We went up the shelf, came back on the shelf, went back on the metro, back on the train. And it was a normal, what would have normally been a normal day for me? I 
was exhausting. <laughs> but I will tell you, that was one of the greatest times I've had. But when she became one of Houston's disciples, it wasn't could you, it was what do you need to do? What do you, could you, could you? Not could you, would you, but you're going to. <laughs> and, uh, another thing that was when you took communion from Houston, I really found the fact that the evening the next to you very, very spiritually grounded. Very spiritually grounded. And I'm going to listen to that. I also wanted to say that I I came with the same kind of David group did in 1984, and uh, actually I started in 82. I brought my honeymoon in before, this was our first date. Uh, but uh, when Houston came in to my life, it was uh, at a time when not too long after that uh, David Farrell had told us in three years I'm retiring. Then it was in two years I'm retiring. Then it was in one year I am retiring. And it seemed like nobody was doing anything to find a replacement for an irreplaceable man. Well, it ended up that we didn't have a pastor, and David Farrell said, Bye. <laughs> And Houston stepped forward. We did things we'd never done before because just like he cared for people who were special needs, he also cared for people who were not in our community. So we had a Kwanzaa celebration. We had a Seder feast. We had, we had things that we had never had before because he truly was a man who believe in the unity of humanity through Christ or through whatever avenue he took. And he was right there to meet you. And I really miss him. And I love you too. Uh, I'm Alana Brooks, and I'm going to do it in two parts. Uh, I'm a recently appointed member of the governing board of our denomination, and Dr. David Williams was in group. He's a treasurer, and there was a, a traffic problem, so he wasn't able to uh, come. So I want to acknowledge and bring greetings on behalf of MCC's governing board, and uh, just just know that you're in our hearts and our love. But I also want to staff at uh, Founders Metropolitan Church of Los Angeles, and I want to extend our communities uh, to you and our condolences. But what I really have come to do is, is really make, uh, which is kind of difficult at the time, uh, the time constraints of that, and it's good, but it's true. What I can simply say, and especially in times that we live now, Houston was kind to me. He was nice. He treated me with respect. And sometimes in that, this kind of a world, it was important to me. He would zip on and do his thing. He wanted to make sure worship, you know, was um, always an excellence. But I appreciate that connection. And when I had the opportunity to preach at the 9-11, I said, oh, it's 9 o'clock. we we'll watch out. I hope I get better at 11. But he was just very encouraging. So I really just want to say thank you, Bruno, family, Connie, um, Connie as the men, all of you. Thank you for sharing Houston. Um, some of you might know me as the person who has been having Keanu in the face. <laughs> My name is Nancy, I've been working here since uh, the 80s. And um, Pastor Dan and Houston and uh, Ron Harris, who used to be our uh, organ there, would be every Tuesday at 5. I work in the Oceanside, so I just stay here during the day. And um, every Tuesday, we to bring our lunch, like that. Anyway, and um, I'm the person who's kind of sitting in front, and it's always been Houston who's rolling in their body. And um, it's an empty space right now. 
but uh, we often had our differences. We were both choruses, to speak, but um, not really, totally chorus. So we had a little really issues there about who's too loud, who's not loud, we're talking to each other back there about something people, shh, shh, here's the world's best sugar. <laughs> best sugar. And, and then later on, you know, I say, oh, sorry about that, or I say, sorry about that. And, and um, so the last Sunday that we were here, that Houston was here, we were fishing each other. And then, but before we, that we always say, love you, which I'm so grateful for. Anyway, I will miss him, and that space will be a space for a long time. Thank you, Pastor Man. I'm not a member here, although I've been a friend of this church since the Choyas View days, back in the early 70s. Privileged to be affiliated with a number of your friends. I see Al Smith and all there. We go back a long time. Well, I knew the church before Houston became part of it, and I knew Houston before he became part of it, uh, mainly because his father and I were colleagues for over 40 years at San Diego State. And Houston was privileged, young Houston was privileged to have two wonderful mothers his birth mother, Trish, whom I knew very well. And after her passing, his dad found Connie, and she became just a wonderful stepmom to Houston. My condolence and blessings to you, Connie, on two terrific losses this year. But my memory, the main memory I have of Houston, I shared with your pastor earlier this week. When Houston was ordained into Christian ministry, it was at a facility over on 30th Street. Do any of you remember that place? That, that was a building put up by Amy Semple McPherson. It became the first four square church in San Diego. And at some point, the MCC was, uh, was allowed to buy that building, that facility, and stayed there for several years. That was back in the David Farrell era. And I recall going to Houston Junior's ordination service on a Sunday afternoon, and the, the experience that will, for, will forever be sealed in my consciousness uh, was referred to by one of the other speakers this morning. It had to do with the communion service, with the Holy Year of the Eucharist, the celebration of the Eucharist. When we were invited to come forward, my wife and I came forward and sat and knelt at the chair where Houston was administering the elements. <clears throat> and for me, the Eucharist is a very sacred moment in Christian worship. I, I really treasure that time in worship, wherever I am, whatever denomination. From that particular instance, when, when Houston Jr. was ordained, is the most profound experience of the Eucharist I have ever experienced. He placed his hands kind of lean forward toward my wife and me and prayed for us and administered the elements. And I, I don't know that I've ever felt closer to Christ and had a more profound sense of the holiness of that particular ritual of our church than I had under the ministry of Houston Burnside Jr. And for that, I will be forever grateful. Two more. My name is Yogi, and I've been a part of the MCC community for about 17 years. I was a baby. <laughs> um, when I came to the church, it was uh, as a girlfriend. And I was very adamant about not being converted, and very adamant about staying as close to the door as possible. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I tried really hard to look intimidating. I wore a thick leather jacket, and I always had like a native stern, stoic face. And uh, over a period of time, uh, Houston just kept 
getting closer and closer to my location. <laughs> <laughs> he noticed that I went to all the choir practices. I was an choir member in my girlfriend work at the time, and he really, really, really believed in recruiting me. <laughs> because he needed someone to do PowerPoint. <laughs> and he figured, she's there, why not? And one day, he wouldn't let me leave. <laughs> and so he spoke to me, and uh, he's the man that taught me how to do PowerPoint, and how to make videos, and eventually I ended up joining the choir. And, um, he was he was my mentor when I was the, on the government's alternative worship ministry team, mm -hmm. and uh, had some really rough conversations with him when I was on the board of directors. He wasn't afraid to be in disagreement because he believed in what. In the way he believed, he just he really wanted to make sure that you understood, and it was important to him that he understood you. And uh, Nancy's right; he's very stubborn. <laughs> <laughs> um, I remember one particular time we must have sat there for twenty minutes in complete angry silence at each other. <laughs> but neither one of us left, and that was important. Um, I think, at least for my generation, there's a lot of acquiescing people trying to be really polite. And uh, you don't get anywhere with that. There are some plants that only grow in rocky soil. And he was a lovely man. He was my rocky soil. He helped grow me up. So I'm a member here at MCC. I've just been here a couple of years, so I had a brief yet meaningful connection with Reverend Houston and over the last few days especially, I've been reflecting on the points of connection that we had, and I boiled it down really to two major points, one being music and the other being social justice. So I thought of a song that I'll just spontaneously offer in and which I believe um, encapsulates those two points of connection. Uh, the song is called Swing Low Sweet Chariot, and it actually can be traced back, for those of you who may not know, it can be traced back to the shameful days of formalized slavery in our country. And some say that the lyrics actually have coded uh, instructions in terms of the Underground Railroad and how to escape. And I'm not sure of that, but I'll leave that to your discernment. All right. Swing and sweet to carry me home, swing low, sweet cherry, come for to carry me home. I Looked over Jordan and what did I see? Coming forth to carry me home. A band of angels coming after me. Coming forth to carry me home. So I'll say it again, swing low, yes, sweet chariot, come forth to carry me home, oh, swing low, 
sweet chariot. Come and forth, come and forth to carry me home. Amen. Maybe a mermaid is in the future. <laughs> service where we were going to be retiring his stalls, but we're not retiring his stalls like he never retired. <laughs> right. We're passing them on. And I'm so grateful to be able to wear this and and Reverend Cademan has received uh, all of Reverend Houston's albs, the purple and the red and the green. And uh, even having that worn last Sunday it was beautiful to be able to see Reverend Houston's uh, all right here up on the platform with all of us. The good thing. There's a story about a pastor of a small congregation, and he's, he kept meticulous record of every single one of the parishioners in the congregation. So convinced was he of life after death, the promises of Jesus about eternal life, that whenever a parishioner died, he didn't delete their name from the register. He simply wrote after the person's name changed residence, gone to live elsewhere. And those belonging to us who have died have not gone away. They've simply gone on ahead to join loved ones 
So by the power vested in me by the gospel of Jesus Christ, I hereby transfer Reverend Houston's membership from this church to the church in heaven, where he'll join with the choirs of the angels in the eternal praise of God. And we know that Reverend Houston loved to sing yes. and loved to give praise to God. What a beautiful voice. And now, Reverend Houston giving a special music that he presented here just a year ago, January.
to join me in prayer. Thou only art immortal, the creator and maker of humankind, and we are mortal, formed of the earth, and unto earth shall we return. For so thou did ordain when you created us, saying, Dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Into thy hand, O merciful Savior, we commend thy son Houston. We acknowledge, we humbly beseech you, a sheep of thine own flock, a son of thy own redeemed, receive him into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace and into the glorious cover of all the saints. And now, God, hear us as we together pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. John 14, and Jesus said to his disciples, Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, and believe also in me. In my Creator's house there are many dwelling places, and if it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, and I will take you to myself, so that where I am, you may be also. Let's hold on to that blessed hope as we leave this celebration of life service. On Veterans Day, there's a book that uh, shows how Reverend Houston was honored at Miramar National Cemetery. It was a beautiful uh, way to have his ashes inured in this beautiful place. And so I say, and I ask you to join me, that God's blessing rest upon Reverend Houston's ashes and the ashes of his little puppy dogs that are already mixed in there with his also that his memory might inspire us to that same kind of passion, integrity, determination, and fortitude that he lived. Rest in peace, dear Houston. In the name of the Creator, the Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please rise as you are able for our final song.
Condolences to you, Bruno, you, Sue, you, Kami, to the rest of the family. God be with all of you and all of us as we go forth from here. In the name of God, our Creator, the Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. 